Good morning. Welcome to uh, 9.30 worship service. Listen to what Christ says. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, we give you adoration and praise for you are God of our salvation. In Jesus Christ, you have chosen us and rescued us from sin. And you call us as your children. So Lord, as we come before you to worship in the spirit and in truth, open the gates of heaven. Receive our praise. Re receive our thanksgiving. And as we bring all of our burden, all of our brokenness, our pain and our sin and lay them down at the foot of the cross. Forgive us and cleanse us and send forth the word of your grace and the fire of the Holy Spirit that will bring healing and cleansing to our soul and body, our family and community. Lord, open the gates of heaven. Pour your spirit upon us. Meet us here. We offer this worship service unto you. To God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Let us affirm our faith by using the words of Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you are able, let's stand and let's lift up our voices and let's proclaim the power of his blood. What can wash away? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of
Gracious and loving God, we are here once again, standing before your presence by the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. May the triune God receive all the glory and honor through our worship today. May our praises bring glory to your name, Father God. May, your, may you find delight in what we do at this hour. Oh, Father God. We express our deepest love to you in this hour. We confess that we only desire your presence and your heavenly peace and your embrace at this hour. So, Father God, grant us 
undivided heart as we come before you. For we love to be in your presence. Meet your people today. And may your people be fed through your word and empowered through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Father God, we come faithfully before your presence with contrite hearts. For we give all the things that we have done to please ourselves. We have followed our own instincts, desire of our flesh. Oh, Father God, pardon all of our guilt and sinful deeds. Grant us clean hearts. Renew a steadfast spirit within us as David has prayed. As your steadfast love and mercy cover this church for the past 50 years, may all of your people be glad and enjoy the jubilee blessings that you have given upon your church today. May all of the bondage of past sins be broken and may, may all of us be set free by the power of the blood of the Lamb. May we not be defined as who we are based on our past, but in you alone. Oh God of mercy, do not remember the sins of our youth and our rebellious ways as David prayed. But help us to hold on to the promises that you have declared in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Help us to abide by your words and in you, for we are lifeless and worthless if we are cut away from you, just as branch needs to be attached to the trunk. So heal your people, oh Father God physically and also spiritually who are broken. Restore their body and their soul. Renew their spirit, Father God. And may they if raise us up with new strength. And may our dependence grow deeper and stronger as our days go by. May we be able to confess that you alone are what we desire in our lives and what we live for your glory alone. Oh, Father God, bless our next generation ministries and our next generation children. May they be trained and raised up to love and serve you with greater intensity and dedication. Send and ra raise up new workers for your kingdom ministries. Guide and guard our next children with your word as many of them are returning to schools and campuses. May they learn to trust and fear you and learn to walk with you as they have to live in this society and world while not drifting away from your grace. Grant them a double portion of faith and grace so that they may live as victor victors, changing the world for your kingdom's glory. And we lift up all of the missionaries into your merciful hands. Honoring them with your spirit of empowerment and boldness. May they be used for spreading your love and mercy to this broken world and the lost and the hopeless. May the ministries yield many fruits that you desire from them. And help us to continue on with our prayer supporting them. Grant us another wave of great spiritual awakening upon this nation that you have done before. May all of us repent our selfish ways of life, our useless attempts to hide from your presence and to live according to our own desires. Oh, Father God, consume all of our arrogance and our weakness. May this nation and the people turn away from this destructive path and seek your face. May the, this nation realize, utilize all of the blessings and richness that you have given for the purpose of bringing glory to your name. Oh, Father God, use this nation as an epicenter for the world mission. mission. Grant your peace to the different parts of the world where there is fighting 
and killing and death. May the hope of gospel be proclaimed to the ends of the world. And also we pray for the unification of South and North Korea through your grace and mercy. Grant us a day where people in North Korea are set free from the lies and oppression and worship you freely, acknowledging you as their king and their Lord. Oh, Father God, be with Pastor Samuel as he proclaims your word to us today. Use him mightily for your purpose. May your living word touch every heart and may your living word awaken our souls. And may our hearts tremble before your word so that we may run the heavenly race that you have placed in our lives. Oh, Father God, hear our prayers and receive our worship as we come before you at this hour. We love you, Father God, and we pray all these in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Announcement. Uh, preschool program starts today. Back to school prayer night on uh, February, uh, September 9th, Friday, and continue to support those who are on short term mission. Daily living water for month of September is available at the library. And I want to open up this time sharing joys and concern. If you have items of praise or thanksgiving or prayer need that you want to share with us, raise your hand. And Uncle Mike, welcome back. <laughs> But I hope you, you will continue to serve in Sunday school. Yes. Not just when your grandkids are here, but I, I hope you, you get back to. Yeah. Wonderful to see you serving during VVS. And, yeah. So we have a back to school coming up. So we, they, they will need more volunteers in children's ministry. Any item of praise Thanksgiving? Oh, Bill Brays came back from their visit too last week. Go ahead, Mike. Praise God. Mm -hmm. I'm just moving and relocating now. Praise God for his favor. Anybody else? Items of praise Thanksgiving? All right. Let's, let's turn to the scripture, scripture lesson this morning. Hebrews 11.37 and Isaiah chapter 6. Hebrews 11.37, let's read all together. They were put to death by stoning. They were sowed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Let me read Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him was seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. He said, go and tell these people, be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of these people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart and turn and be healed. Then I said, 
For how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left des deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leaves stumps, when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us continue our study in Hebrews chapter 11. The second phrase in Hebrews 11, 37. They were so in two. There was a prophet who had gone before us who was sown in two. It's not written in scripture, but according to the oral tradition, which was later recorded by the rabbis in early Judaism. Uh, uh, the tradition tells it that this is none other than prophet Isaiah. King Hezekiah's son, evil son, Manasseh, he killed prophet Isaiah. By sowing him in two. He's the only person among the prophets that is known to, to be killed that way. But he says, they were, so there may be other saints who have gone before us. So we are embarking on study through the book of Isaiah because he is one of the greatest prophets. Among all the Old Testament books, Isaiah has been studied most extensively. Even among the Jews, he is regarded as one of the greatest prophets. Over 50 times, New Testament directly quotes from the book of Isaiah. And if you look at some of the verses that actually has Isaiah on its background, alluding to Isaiah's you know, prophecy, it will become 250 times the New Testament refer back to Isaiah. Some of you know Handel's Messiah, the oratorio, the great, of course, the most famous is the Hallelujah Chorus. But if you read the lyrics of the, all the songs in Handel's oratorio, Messiah, it is actually all quoting from the book of Isaiah. Handel weaves different portions, different verses of Isaiah to speak about Messiah who will come. And the suffering and his resurrection and the risen Christ who will reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's Handel's Messiah. So for the next few weeks, we will look at some of the important portions of the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was called to prop, the ministry of prophecy in the year 740 B.C., the year King Uzziah died. He was called 740 and after King Uzziah died, his son Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. So at least over 40 years, Isaiah was called to speak God's word to his people. And at the time, the Jews were divided into two, northern kingdom Israel and southern kingdom Jerusalem, uh, uh, Judah. And Isaiah's ministry centered around Jerusalem and southern kingdom of Judah, but 18th year of his ministry, that will be 722 before Christ. Northern kingdom Israel is destroyed by Assyrian empire. All the people are taken either prisoner or they are scattered to the nations because Assyrian empire had a policy. Wherever they conquer the land, they don't want people to rise up as in seeking independence. So what they have done was they forced migration of conquered people. They mixed people everywhere. So people from the east will come move to the west. People from Israel will move their way to faraway land. And that's why northern kingdom, maybe Israel, later on become all these mixed people, Samaritans. Now, in the southern kingdom of Judah, they saw their northern kingdom brothers. Because of their sin and disobedience, God's judgment came upon them. The nation was destroyed. People were taken prisoner or they were scattered all over the nations. But they don't take a lesson. People of Judah and Jerusalem, they continue their idolatry 
and their moral degeneration. And in such a time, Isaiah was called to speak God's message. And his commission is recorded in chapter, verse 9 and following of chapter 6 that I just read today. Now, when you read the book of Isaiah as a whole, 66 chapters, chapter 1 through 39 is the message of judgment. But from chapter 40 until chapter 66, there is message of hope. God's judgment will come, and it will be Babylonian captivity, but God will leave a stump in the, in the ground, like a remnant. And God will restore them. God will give them salvation. It's a message of hope that God will bring specially. God will send Messiah through whom salvation will come, not only to people of Israel, but all over the world. That's from chapter 40 to 66. Some Bible scholars actually think Isaiah is actually so two part. First Isaiah and second Isaiah. But it is same prophet who was given the message of judgment. But because of God's faithfulness, there will come salvation, comfort, and hope. And, and, and it's not coincident that Isaiah is 66 chapters. The Bible is 66 books, 39 books of Old Testament, 27 books of New Testament in much the same way. Book of Isaiah, chapter 1 through 39 is message of judgment. But chapter 42, 66, 27 chapters, message of salvation and hope through the Messiah. Wow. So here, chapter 6, verse 1 starts with death of King Uzziah, which is symbolic. Uzziah began as a good, faithful king. Second Chronicles 26.5 says it this way. He sought God during the days of Zechariah who instructed him in the fear of God. There was a priest, Zechariah, who was teaching him how to fear the Lord. As long as Zechariah was teaching him, he was seeking God. So as long as he sought the Lord. God gave him success. God gave him prosperity. God gave him strength where he had strong army, developed new weapons. They were able to build fortified cities, had great victory against the Philistines. God gave him victory and success and prosperity. And then, because of this continuing success, he's not become proud. He says, you know, I'm going to go into the holy, the holy place of the temple, and I will offer incense. As you know, in Moses' law, it was only the priest who was allowed into the holy place, and offering the incense was strictly reserved to the sons of Aaron, the priests who were consecrated. So he says, I'm a successful king. God's favor is upon me. So he became a proud. He disregarded God's word and he enters into the holy place, forbidden place. The great priest, high priest, Azariah and 80 other priests, a valiant man, they all rushed. Your majesty, you can't go in there. Only priest is allowed into this place. It's God's law. You are violating God's law. Please leave now. I'm the king. Who prevents me? He gets angry. The moment in the holy place, he shows anger on his forehead. The signs of this leprosy. Immediately, leprosy broke out. Azariah and other priests, get out of here. God has struck you. God has struck him with leprosy. He was driven out of the temple right away. And even in his palace, he had to be segregated on another room. Never be able to go back into the temple for the rest of his life. And his own son, the crown prince Jotham, became the co-regent. Actually, he couldn't come out of the seclusion. His son ran affairs of the state for 12 years. And Uzziah died. 
that's 12 years after his leprosy broke out. When he began as faithful king, God blessed him. He was successful. He was victorious. He was prosperous. But because he became proud and disobeyed God's word, he was struck with leprosy. And he was living in seclusion, isolation. And he dies in humiliation. You know, when leprosy first broke out, it appears his health was holding up somewhat. But leprosy was spreading his, all over his body. And all the signs of disease spread all over his body. And finally, on 12th year, he dies. Now, Isaiah says, Judah is just like King Uzziah. You are struck with leprosy. Why? Because you have forsaken God. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a root of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have turned their backs on the Holy One of Israel. He says, we, your people, we are just like Uzziah, struck with leprosy. And this leprosy had spread all over the body. I'm reading verse 5 and 6 of chapter 1. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart is afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores like leprosy. Not cleansed or bandaged or suited with olive oil. That's the whole historical background and situation of the people among whom Isaiah was called to speak God's word. On chapter 6, he records the incident where he was called to be a prophet. It's like a biographical description. Chapter 6 begins with revelation of God's holiness. You see, Isaiah was born a, 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 in a priestly family. He was born in aristocratic family in Jerusalem, wealthy, highly regarded priest family. And because he was born in priest family and he also became a priest, he knew the scripture. He knew the law. He knew how to conduct worship. He went to temple every day and he probably served in various roles. You know, that was the temple that Solomon built. It was still standing. In that majestic temple, they had Levite choir, probably a couple of hundred people. They had all kinds of orchestra with choir and orchestra performing in that awesome, majestic temple. Probably was very moving ceremony. So he participated in worship service where indeed was quite moving. But yet, Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1. This was the first time heaven opened. I mean, he was clergy. He was a pastor all these years. But this is the first time heaven opens. God opens his spiritual eyes. This is going beyond the, all the religious practices that he's participated so far. It's not just religion in the head. He felt some of these worship service sacrifices were moving. Probably there were tears flowing. But this particular day, heaven opened. And this is what he says. I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne. Hear that once again. I saw Jehovah, God. I saw God. He's entered temple, offer sacrifice, led worship every day as a priest. But his first time, he says, I saw Jehovah. I saw God. Just like heaven opened and Isaiah's spiritual eyes, vision opened up. We need this kind of experience. You know? When we read 
ever since that moment for Isaiah, heaven always stayed open. He was always living in the presence of God. From that moment on, what other people said didn't matter anymore. Heaven was open. So I'm not talking about attending a very religious moving experience, a conference, or some kind of retreat where you have some moving one-time ex- No. This left lifelong impact. His life orientation changes. The way he lives changes from here on. Heaven opens. I saw God. Heavenly Father opened heaven for me. When heaven opened, what did he see? The holiness of God was powerfully revealed to him. He says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and his train and he, of his robe filled the temple. Above him was seraphim, six wings. With two, they cover their face. With two, they cover their feet. With two, they are flying. And they are crying out to each other with loud voice. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Why three times? Three symbolize perfection. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Some say seven is a perfect number or twelve. Three perfect full number. It's not just three times. Angelic beings are crying out. Continually, forever. Holy, holy, holy. And at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and, and threshold shook. The whole building is shaking because of their crying out, Holy, holy. Brothers and sisters, I want you to imagine with me. If Isaiah's hearing this, angels crying out, Singing praise, holy, holy. And it's, it's shaking the whole building. I'm sure his body, his guts shaking. Holy, holy, holy. Angels are declaring. No other sound you can hear. Whole building, it's like thunder and lightning falling like 100 feet from you. Wham! And whole building is shaking and you're hearing the thunder. Just like that. Holy, holy, God is holy. This holiness of God is shaking the building, shaking his, his being. We are in the third year of COVID pandemic. And, and some of us, in terms of our spiritual discipline and, and the way we worship God, has become just... Should I say, we became spiritually lazy and our spiritual visions becoming dim. And some people are just turning on just once a week on internet. That's not real worship. We need to seek the Lord. We need to seek this grace and mercy of open heaven. Grace of God needs to be poured upon our hearts and our lives. So we need... This, this revival of worship where our spiritual vision opens and gates of heaven opens. And when the gates of heaven opens, we need revelation of God's holiness that will shake us to the core, waking our, our souls from spiritual slumber. Angels are declaring, holy, 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 holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. When your spiritual vision is open, we recognize, wow, the whole earth is filled with his glory. He's sitting on a throne high and exalted. We are living in the midst of a pandemic. There's a war going on. And because of all this climate change, famine, Lake Mead is drying up. Colorado River is drying up. And there's a wildfire, but also in other places, downpours. The record rainfall in 100 years, 100, 
you know, just two weeks ago, downtown Seoul was just submerged. You know, one month of precipitation just fell in one hour. Never before. So we are living in times of chaos. All kinds of uncertainty, chaos, but because God is high and exalted, sitting on the throne. His rule, his authority, his throne, he's not shaken by all these things, all this chaos. He's watching, high and exalted. And his sovereign will is turning the course of history. Oh no, it's not like God is not involved. He sovereignly oversees all the unfolding of his will and his purpose. And he is holy. That's what Isaiah realized. Wow. God is sitting on the throne, exalted. And angels are declaring, he is holy. Suddenly, how does he respond from verse 5? Woe to me, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. And mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I'm going to die. Lightning bolt's going to strike me now. He hears the angels declaring and shouting and praising, Holy, holy, holy. The whole temple is shaking. The ground is shaking. He is shaking. Oh, God is holy. And suddenly he's dead scared. I'm a sinful man. I can't stand in God's presence, holy presence. I'm a sinful man. I'm rowing. He has such a fear, disaster will strike him at any moment. Such a fear, shaken to the core. He says, I'm a person of unclean lips. I live among the people of unclean lips. That means... Man, we, are, we have much fault with what we say with our lips. We say things that we will regret when we look back. We say things that we can't take it back. But it has already brought shame to ourselves or hurt others. Because of the fault, sin on our lips, we hurt others and we are also injured by others' unkind words. Two weeks ago, as I spoke about Jeremiah, I shared with you how in Jeremiah, the word of God was like a fire in his soul. Fire locked in his bones. But for us, it's not word of God burning in our heart. It is other people's words, gossip, misunderstanding, speaking things about me that reach our ear, it burns our heart. It turns our stomach upside down. It's like, oh, I am so upset. Fire burning inside of me. Not because of God's word, but what other people have said. So we need, just like Jeremiah, oh God, may your word come like a fire in my heart. Burn my, not only my sin, but all my wounds. When other people's unkind words bring hurt, that means their words have become the fiery arrow of the enemy, the devil. And he has lodged in my heart. And that's why I am hurting. I need the fire of God, word of God that will come and not only burn my sin, but burn other people's unkind words. The hurts and wounds will be burned. Hearing this sermon just once on Sunday morning doesn't, doesn't work. You need to cry this out. God, let your word become like a fire in my heart that will burn. Oh God, let angels cry, holy, holy, holy. The whole building is shaking. My body is shaking. I can't hear anything else. I don't hear what other people say. Only holiness of God being revealed. I am that scared. Oh God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. In such a humble confession, an angelic being brings this burning call. 
and touches his lips and it declares. Because this has, this fire has touched your lips. Your sin is purged. All your sins are covered. We need that experience. God, may the fire of Holy Spirit come and touch my lips and my heart. To burn not only my sin, but all the wounds, all the pain. What other people say doesn't matter no more because fire of God has come and burnt. Burnt the enemy's arrow. Burnt those unkind words as well as my own foolish word that brought hurt to others and embarrassment and shame to myself and my family. All my mistakes that I regret. All the, all the failures. All of my own sin, that needs cleansing, as well as my wounds needs cleansing. Friday morning, the meditation text for our morning was Jesus cry, uh, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was asking Peter, James, and John, stay awake with me and pray. Stay awake. Watch. Pastor Brian was preaching from the pulpit Friday morning. He says, when Jesus says, watch, that's different from the ten virgins who had to watch and wait for arrival of the bridegroom. Because the arrival of br bridegroom was delayed. Everybody fell asleep. They all fell asleep. But when bridegroom came, five were ready to welcome with additional oil. So that watch means you are being ready to welcome Jesus' second coming. But on Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus says, watch and wait, what does it mean? Know the heart of Jesus. Connect with the heart of Jesus. Share. You also learn his heart and operate out of his heart. That's how he preached Friday morning. And as I was praying, what was Christ feeling? What was in the heart of Jesus? In Garden of Gethsemane, he was sweating blood because he was so agonizing. Why? Here was sinless son of God. All the sins of God's people who will be saved, all their sin was just fallen upon him. He will be accused of all the wrongs that everybody else has done. He was sinless son of God. He's taking all of their sin, punishment and curses, God's anger toward all of their sin will come upon him. This is injustice. This is wrong. He's done nothing wrong, but he, he will be punished. He will take all the curses and punishment for their, all the sin. Horrendous things that I and you have done fell upon him. What an injustice. Unfair. That's what Jesus has done. The most unjust evil was done unto him. That's why he was sweating tears and he says, God, can you let this cup pass me? If it's possible. But not as I will. But your will be done. That wasn't easy. He's done nothing wrong. But he will receive punishment and curses for my failure and my sin and all of our upon him. How unfair, unjust. But submitting to God and say, not what I want, but what you want. went to the cross. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, you have to deny yourself. Daily carry your cross and follow me. What does it mean to deny ourselves in daily carrying our cross? I need to deny myself. My feeling. My feeling this is unjust. This is unfair. I'm being tormented, hurt by their gossip. 
I have done nothing wrong, but they are doing this to me. Just like Jesus. Would you let it go? And let Jesus be honored? And let gospel bear fruit? And let church of Jesus Christ be built up? Whatever it takes, whatever pain, whatever hardship and difficulty I have to bear to please him, I'm willing to take the cup. That's what carrying my cross means. And it has to happen daily. Not just once, but daily. That's what Jesus was praying in Gethsemane. And we need to learn his heart. So that we will also say, Father, this hurts. But I bring all my pain, all my hurt, as well as my failure and sin, as well as my worries and problem, and lay them down at the foot of Jesus. Lord, let the burning fire call from, from the altar come and touch my lips and touch my heart. Let my sin be burnt. Let my wounds all these troubles be burnt so they all be cleansed. Angel declares, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is purged. We need this grace of God. The fire of God that will come to burn not only our sin and guilt, but all the wounds. All the unkind words that people gossip about me that, that hurt me, torment me. It needs to be burned. No longer bothers me. But my heart may enjoy peace that Jesus wants to give to me. Lord, I need this fire from the altar. All of us who desire, just like Jeremiah, fire of God burning in our heart, would you say amen? Lord, just like Jeremiah, let your word burn like a fire in my heart. Let the burning call from the altar purge my sin, cleanse my lips and my heart. You know, we are trying to reboot our small group ministry. We are trying to organize people in groups of three or four that you will have prayer partner. Ladies will have ladies as a prayer partners. Men will have men as prayer partners. Three, four, why? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The three Hebrew friends of Daniel. When they were attending the Royal Academy of Babylon, they didn't want to defile themselves by eating food that was sacrificed to idols. Even though it came from the kitchen of royal palace, even though their friends were eating filet mignon and lobster, they were only eating vegetables and water every day for how many, three, four years. But every day, whenever they went to cafeteria, they encouraged each other, let's keep our faith. Don't be shaken. Yes, they are eating good hamburger, but don't look. This is for us. They encouraged each other with the word of God. They prayed for one another. We need that, prayer partners. Every day, who will encourage? Oh, don't listen to what people say. Listen to what Jesus says. What if you are shaken by what people say, you will be hurt. But hold on to the word of Jesus. Let word of Jesus Christ shout and shake your building. We need that encouragement. We need prayer from my brothers and sisters so that I will be shaken to senses. Hearing preaching one, one day a week doesn't do it. You need daily reminder. You need to share with your own prayer partners from this week's message. How will I apply in my life? What will I obey? How will I pray throughout this week? You share. You confess that with each other and you pray for each other so that you say, Lord, my brother Bill and Michael, may your word come like a fire in their heart. You pray for each other. You pray for us every day. We need that. Isaiah, heaven opened. God opened his spiritual vision. 
And there was this fresh revelation of God's holiness. Unforgettable. Like completely life-changing revelation of God's holiness. He was shaken to the core, scared. Oh, woe to me. God, I'm a sinner. And then there is this forgiveness and cleansing, the burning coal. And then he hears, whom shall go for us? Whom shall I send? Lord, here am I. Send me. Then God gives him commission. That's from verse 9 and following. Jerusalem and Judah, they are still going downhill, spiritually speaking. Even though they have seen their northern kingdom, brothers, the nation destroyed by Assyrian invasion, and people scattered all over the world. People haven't taken spiritual lessons. They are still continuing in idolatry. So go and preach. Go and speak God's word to the people who will hear but not understand. They will not listen to your preaching and repent. No. But you continue to preach. Then what's the use? No. Because heaven opened. And because Isaiah saw God's holiness from there on, what people say and how people respond doesn't even matter. I'm going to obey God's word. Whatever he tells me to do, regardless of what people do, this is what I'm going to do. Preach, even though they will not respond in repentance. How long, oh Lord? How long? Until the cities are ruined, and the land lay desolate until the Lord will drive all the people far away. Babylonian captivity is coming. Just like their northern kingdom brethren, Israel, which was invaded and destroyed by Assyrian, southern kingdom Judah, because of their disobedience, continuing in sin, there will be Babylonian invasion and the nation will be destroyed. That, that will come 150 years later, 120 years later. But you speak. But there is this message of hope. God will leave holy seed as a stump. The remnant people that God will leave. Through whom God will bring Salvation and restoration. Chapter 1 through 13, uh, 39 is message of judgment, but chapter 40 and following. Especially chapter 40. Comfort ye, my people, comfort ye. For their exile has come to an end. The time of their exile has come to an end. They have received enough punishment for their sin. Now God will restore them. This is a message for People living during the time of Babylonian captivity. Oh, this is time of God's judgment, but God will restore Jerusalem. Oh, God will bring us back to the land. Isaiah probably couldn't imagine when he was called in 740 B.C. Some 60 years later, during time of King Manasseh, he will be sown in two. And die as a martyr. He probably never imagined that. He was a priest from aristocratic family. Probably well treated for most of his life. But his message wasn't welcomed. Until. During the time of Babylonian captivity. And in the succeeding generation. And here we are. We read the message that Isaiah wrote 600 years before Jesus Christ came. And we read, a virgin shall give a birth. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We see, wow, he was afflicted for my transgression. Because he was stricken, we are healed. We read from book of Isaiah, oh, this is the meaning of why, why Christ my Savior has suffered. We receive so much strength and blessing from his word. Why? Heaven open. God's holiness was revealed. 
and Isaiah became a changed man. His life orientation changed. How he lived changed from that moment on. Revelation of holiness and confession of sin. The fire of God coming and cleansing. Sin and guilt and wounds, all worries. So that when God gave him a commission, he wasn't shaken by people's response. But he was faithful to do what God told him to do. We need that. God, open the gates of heaven. Open my eyes that I may behold your holiness in a fresh new way. That will change the way I live from here on. It's like angels declaring, holy, 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 shaking the whole building. Even like Isaiah being shaken to the core and saying, oh, God is holy. I'm scared. I'm sinful. True repentance and God's forgiveness and cleansing. That not only takes away our sin and guilt, but all our wounds. What has been bothering us so far? Let the fire of God come and burn. Lord, we need heaven's fire. So that from here on, we will not be shaken by what people say, but we will do what you call me to do. Join me in a prayer. In your words, would you ask God to open heaven? Open your spiritual eyes and asking for the fire of God in your heart. It'll take away not only sin and guilt, but all wounds, all trouble. upon us just like Jeremiah we desire your word will come like a fire burning in our heart fire of God locked in our our bones Lord would you open heaven would you open our spiritual eyes so that we we may come to fresh fresh revelation fresh recognition of your holiness that will change the way we live from your own. Oh God, grant us greater understanding of your holiness. And as we confess our sins and our brokenness, grant us forgiveness and cleansing. Like the burning fire from the altar, touching Isaiah's lips. Lord, we need fire of God touching our lips and our hearts. Purging our sin that we will no longer say things that are foolish, that are hurtful to others. Lord, cleanse our lips. And not only cleanse our lips, but Lord, clean our heart. Burn what other people have said that's troubling us. Burn. Lord, let your word, let your fire burn all sin and wounds. Let Satan's arrow be burned by the holy fire of God so that it will no longer torment and bother us. Lord, have mercy. May we live in the holiness of God so that we will not be shaken by what people say, but we will do what pleases you. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of God the Father and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon all of us from now on and forever. Amen.